Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Making government work for the people. Can budgets and even the Federal Reserve be brought under public control? This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we hear from Josh Lerner about the participatory budgeting project and Connie Raza about her group, Fed Up. All that and a few words from me about money. Welcome to our program. Can direct democracy come to a city near you? One radical tool for grassroots democracy that's taking hold is participatory budgeting. Yes, you've got that right, participatory, and that participant could be you. Take a look at this video from the Meerkat Media Collective. That's right, if you live in this community and you pay taxes, come out and vote, decide how your tax dollars get spent. Participatory budgeting gives people real power over real money to make the decisions that affect their lives. It's a democratic process in which ordinary community members directly decide how to spend part of the public budget. Well, this is different because you're actually voting for where the money is going to be spent instead of allowing them to decide where to spend the money. Who knows better about their community than the people that live in their community? not be afraid of the big words, participatory budgeting. It sounds boring, but it's the opposite of that. So how does it work? First, people brainstorm ideas. They come together in meetings and assemblies and start to think of what kinds of projects they would like to see in their neighborhood. We had to think big. We have a million dollars that we could use so we can fund parks, health issues, streets. Volunteers work with experts to turn people's initial ideas into full project proposals. We started with maybe about 40 projects, and so we had a series of budget delegate meetings, and we narrowed down the list into about four or five projects. We met with the Parks Department, and we talked about what we wanted to see change in some of the parks and how we were going to work with them. What are the real needs of the community? If you only have a certain amount of money, what is it that you can do that's going to benefit as many people as possible? I'm dreaming of new benches, modern benches. Seniors have no way to go. Displays at bus shelters throughout the district, and it will tell people when their next bus is due to arrive. We're asking for a projector and 30 Mac laptops. State of the art to fitness center. To put solar panels on a firehouse. After volunteers share the top projects, the community gets ready to vote. It's a way of validating every voice in our community and saying, you know what, whatever your position is, you live in our community, you have a right to decide. And that me as a representative and government should respond and should listen to that voice. Anybody could vote in this process, immigrants, whether you're documented or not, young people that normally don't get to vote. Most people, they don't even know that 16 year olds can come out here and vote today. Some of them are really surprised. They said, really? I said, yeah. They have a voice. Projects with the most votes get funded. The Red Hook Library Community Garden. Yeah. Right here. The projects are then implemented over the next few years. And the following year, the process starts again. People brainstorm new ideas, turn them into new projects, vote on them, and fund more improvements for their community. PB becomes part of the budget process. It becomes a new way of governing. I think this is like the greatest wave of democracy coming into the United States. It started in Porto Alegre, Brazil in 1989. From there, it spread all over Latin America to over 1,500 cities around the world. In Toronto, public housing tenants have decided how to spend millions of dollars on improvements to their buildings. City council members in Chicago, New York, and other cities have engaged thousands of residents in allocating discretionary funds. Entire cities have launched PB, such as in Vallejo, California, for funds from a sales tax, and in Boston for youth funds. Even schools and universities have used PB. This was a great opportunity for you to be a part of government and better the city you live in. Like, who wouldn't want to take advantage of that? You're creating a more educated platform of voters overall. So I think this can only be good for the big project of democracy. Josh Lerner is co-founder and executive director of the Participatory Budgeting Project. He has over 15 years of experience working with community engagement programs across North America, Latin America, and Europe. 
He's the author of two books, both released last year, Making Democracy Fun, How Game Design Can Empower Citizens and Transform Politics, and Everyone Counts, Could Participatory Budgeting Change Democracy? Welcome to the program, Josh. Glad to have you. Thanks for having me. So can it? Can participatory budgeting change democracy? It, it can and it has actually across the world. So starting around 25 years ago, it's been transforming democracy at the local level and giving people real power over real money in around 3,000 cities around the world. Oh, and where did the idea come from? It started in Porto Alegre, Brazil, a small city in the south of Brazil. And it emerged as a way to correct for great inequality, where people with the most power were deciding how public money was spent and everyone else was left out. And how to get here then? We brought it here, actually. <laughs> so my organization uh, started out in 2009, starting in one ward in, sh in Chicago, launching a pilot program there. And since it first worked in Chicago, it's been really taking off across the country as people see that it gives them a new way to exercise their democratic rights. All right, so if somebody hears that there's participatory budgeting in their town, in their sh Chicago community, or maybe here in New York, uh, what can they do? What, and what can they expect? Yeah, so it's a process in which ordinary people can directly decide how to spend part of a public budget. And so you usually come out to a public meeting, brainstorm ideas for what you'd like to see happen in your neighborhood. And then we ask volunteers to turn those ideas into real projects together with experts. Put them on a ballot and there's a vote and you can come out and vote for which projects you want to see happen in your city, in your neighborhood. And the winning projects get funded and they make, they make a big difference in your community. Mm, so describe a meeting for me. I've heard amazing things. I mean, people I know have said they would far rather go to a participatory budgeting meeting than well, vote in the local city council election. It, it sounds boring, but if there's real money on the table and you know that your participation will have a direct impact, so if there's a million dollars on the table, it's up to you to come out and determine how the money gets spent. Mm -hmm. So you'll have neighbors coming out from across the city, across different districts, people who normally wouldn't talk with each other, public housing residents, uh, parents, high school students, small business owners, coming together on the table and asking, what should our neighborhood look like? What do we want to see in our schools, our parks, our streets? Sharing ideas. And then starting those ideas, then working with the city and turning them into real projects. Mm. And that's where the difference takes place. And what kind of projects typically get brought to the table? So let's say that you have a street in your neighborhood that is dark and dangerous. Maybe there's high crime there. You may come out and say that you want more street lights there. Someone else may say they want a new after school program or improvements to sports fields. And you move those projects forward, meet with city staff to get uh, cost estimates, see if they're feasible. And if they are, you can put them on the ballot, and then the next year, uh, you can have better lighting on that street, and it can become safer. Mm. So how is, the, how is the process in this country looking different from what you saw in, in uh, Puerto Alegre, Brazil, or Venezuela, or some of the other places you mentioned? The, the basic model is the same, of ordinary people directly deciding how to spend their money. But what we see here is there's a lot broader participation and more direct participation and a really broad vote. There's also a lot more work with community organizations. So bringing together grassroots community groups with government to decide and design the process together so that it's building on civic engagement, building on efforts that are already underway in communities. Mm, and what kind of groups have gotten involved? So for example, in New York, we work closely with a group called Community Voices Heard, mm -hmm. which has been organizing low-income residents for around 20 years now and made sure that when it was time for pub public meetings that there were folks from public housing, that there were youth there, that there were people of color who normally may not be at the table. Now, I remember Community Voices Heard was very involved in a project that I thought was fantastic, which is in the period between the election of a new administration in New York and they're actually taking office. This was the de Blasio administration. That group and others held this kind of two-week-long listening session where they invited people to come and talk about the priorities in their town. Now, I thought this would attract, at most, the hardened few. Not at all. The place was packed, huge tent. I was part of a meeting that went on for five hours that people spent that long deciding what were the priority issues and what language did they want inserted into the incoming mayor's agenda that they didn't think was there yet. It helped to educate people about the mayor's agenda and a whole lot more besides, not to mention each other. I was st struck at my own lack of... Um, and low expectations, I guess, because I was truly surprised by how many people turned out. Has that been the same for you, or did you always know this would be a popular thing? Uh, I didn't know. It was an experiment in democracy. It has proven very popular. And what we've seen is people are really eager to participate. 
if it makes a difference. Yeah. They don't want to come to a community meeting for two hours, go home, and have nothing happen. Because we're always told people are apathetic. They're not participating in local government. That the participation rates are down and going lower. And partly it's because people are smart. They know that it often doesn't matter if they participate. The decisions are made behind closed doors by other people and that they can't have a real say. And that's the difference about participatory budgeting is that people know there's really money on the table and they will directly decide how it's spent. So it cuts through some of that apathy that we see. I haven't heard you mention game theory yet, but it's part of your book title. What's yeah, that to do so with my this? book, Making Democracy Fun, looks at how we can fix democracy by redesigning it to be more like a game. And it doesn't necessarily mean making it into a video game. It means taking some of the lessons from game design like. and applying that to democracy, like having um, real measurable outcomes. And people can see the impact of their participation and measure that and know that X dollars are being spent on these projects in these places. They're more likely to come out than if we just say, we want to hear your voice. Mm. So you're not going to tell me that participatory budgeting is going to change people's attitude to taxes now, is it? It actually has been shown to do that. So in, in several studies, they've seen that people are more uh, eager and actually are more likely to pay taxes after going through participatory budgeting. So what are the greatest challenges as you see to this process? Uh, democracy isn't easy. It takes a lot more work to engage, as this year, 51,000 people in New York City than to have a few people in a few rooms at City Hall deciding how to spend funds. And what we've seen is that if that work is put into the process, if there's that investment, then the payoff is really big. But it requires government to place some trust in people and to really invest in the process, to have staff, to have canvassers, to have food, and to have tra uh, translation, interpreters, all these things that make the process accessible and make it work. And will we see participatory design, development planning, community board meetings? Because that's where decisions around gentrification and some of those key issues are getting decided. And although they are ostensibly public, they don't really work that way. Yeah, one of the interesting things is that participatory budgeting often functions as a kind of, kind of gateway drug mm, for democracy. Mm. People start out and they get hooked. And they want to then participate in new ways and join boards and commissions or get involved in planning processes. Once they realize how much more power they could have, then they get more involved in their community groups and in government. So you better watch out if you're a politician. You might actually have a populace that's involved and active. It's also the very popular politically. And so elected officials that do participatory budgeting are around 10% more likely to be reelected. Mm. People like this. It restores the relationship between government up there and people on the ground. Mm. All right. Josh, thanks so much for coming in. You can get more information at our website. You can hear it from Glenn Beck and on right wing radio, kill the Fed. But what is the Federal Reserve? And should we really kill it? Connie Raza works with the Center for Popular Democracy and their Fed Up campaign. And she has some more creative ideas about what to do with the Federal Reserve. She's been a strategic research campaigner for more than a decade, working primarily on campaign design and implementation for labor unions, and working as a senior policy analyst for the New York City Council. Welcome to the program, Connie. Thank you to have you. Thank you. So glad to be here. What's the rights beef with the Fed, just to get started? Well, there are a couple of beefs. Their main beef is that they believe in the so-called free market, and um, that is they want unfettered uh, support for businesses without any kind of um, regulation. The Fed is one regulatory body. Um, another beef that they have is um, the desire to go back to the gold standard. The famous gold standard. Yes. I know I had something to do with the Wizard of Oz, but <laughs> after that you lose me. Right. I mean, I think that it's not really a relevant argument. In this day and age, where we are a currency-based um, sort of economic monetary sort of system globally, the trying to go back to the days of yours is really not a relevant argument at all. I mean, I was impressed when I went to look at the Center for Popular Democracy website and the whole Fed Up campaign um, list of signatories. Mm -hmm. There's pages and pages of groups. How do people get so excited about the Fed? Because, you know, we're all in the streets fighting for um, minimum wage, fighting for fair schedules, fighting for the floor of what a standard for working people should be. Mm -hmm. Having a full employment economy where people are employed who want to be working, where people can quit bad jobs and move to good jobs and know those jobs are there, and where people who are looking for jobs know there are positions for them. Having an economy like that means that we get to imagine what it could be like without a ceiling. 
so what's happening on the streets of Ferguson or Baltimore has something to do with the value of the dollar? Definitely. So it has to do with the value of the dollar. Well, it has to do with the Fed's decision to raise interest rates and slow the economy or to keep interest rates low so that the economy can keep growing. And I mean, one of the things that is so striking to me about all of these communities where people have been um, you know, attacked by the police and where there's been such despair and outcry um, in the face of those attacks is how uh, disinvestment has happened in those communities. Mm. If we're in a, a full employment economy and we have the jobs that we need, there's more investment coming into those communities. The residents of those areas are able to make consumer decisions, but also make real decisions about how to use their local economy and have control over their local economy. But I thought it was the Fed that was the very agency that for years has said, well, we're going to keep a certain level of unemployment, which always came as shocking to me that there were kind of target unemployment levels. We weren't even trying to get rid of it as a whole. Right. So the natural rate of unemployment is the rate of unemployment at which inflation is stable. Mm -hmm. So there are two problems here. One, um, it's completely theoretical. And even as recently as last month or the month before, the Fed had to lower that rate because it was approaching the natural rate of unemployment without any sign of inflation. The second problem is that the Fed has targeted an inflation rate of 2% or lower. Well, wages are part of the inflation rate. Mm -hmm. So that actually caps wage growth. And what we think is a more progressive approach is looking at wage growth as a key and fundamental measure of full employment. So if, wage, if wages are growing at the rate that productivity is growing, mm -hmm. then uh, workers are going to be sharing in the revenues that they're generating and will have much more um, than 2% wage growth because um, productivity has grown by so much. And so we're looking at a 4 to 5% um, wage growth target that would really pull workers out of the wage stagnation we've been facing. So what can people do? What was the Fed Up campaign doing beyond raising this critique and this argument? So a couple of things. One. Um, around the country, local coalitions are calling on Federal Reserve um, boards of directors and the presidents of the regional banks to visit low-income neighborhoods to really see the impact of their monetary policy in their region. You really think they have not any idea? Well, what we think is that they spend a lot more time talking to businesses, to banks, and to corporations, large and small, mostly large, mm -hmm. about what they need out of the economy. This is our invitation to them to talk with everyday people about how we're experiencing the economy. I mean, it really, even just reading your materials made me rethink in the sense that the Fed, I sort of thought, was one of those sort of Wall Street agencies. Reading your materials, I realized, no, it's actually supposed to be a kind of like almost like a New Deal institution. It is a it's a government institution that could be working entirely differently. That's exactly right. One of the things that we found just by sort of adding up the folks who sit on the Fed boards across the country is that 90 percent of the um, boards of directors are um, business people, corporations, um, uh, represent corporations mm -hmm. and banks, whereas the actual structure of the Fed says two-thirds of the directors are supposed to represent the public broadly defined. Mm. So that would certainly include companies, right? It would include agriculture. It would include consumers and labor. It would include a much broader representation. And so we are also calling on the Fed to be more representative and involve people in the um, decisions about who the Fed presidents will be in the future. So if you were advising a presidential candidate or a candidate for the nomination, say Bernie Sanders, what would you recommend in terms of a program point on, the, on this question of the Fed? 
I mean, one would be making sure that the feds are much more representative. So the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, which is the national board as well as the regional boards, much more representative of everyday people, of labor, of consumer groups, as well as banks and corporations. Two, that um, he support the Federal Reserve, which is a somewhat independent um, institution, in holding the course and keeping interest rates low until we're seeing robust full employment and not being scared by inflation hawks who are ginning up, frankly, this fear of inflation. We have an incredibly low inflation rate. Inflation used to mean, as you said, being having enough power in the workplace you're able to actually ask for higher wages. Is that beginning to happen? Is, I mean, aren't we seeing wages go up a, at least a little? Walmart, places like that, that have been resistant for so long? We are seeing it happen bit by bit. The thing that's not happening, though, is actually wage stagnation maintains. We um, are in a s situation where we can point to individual instances. Walmart has chosen to increase its wages, not by enough, by a stretch, but it's definitely a victory for the folks who have been fighting there. But it's not making a dent in wage stagnation. The average American worker hasn't seen their wages go up meaningfully in 35 years. Um, women have been closing the wage gap some, but largely because men's wages have fallen. Right. And so we have a wage situation that's still deeply, deeply troubled. And unemployment is another issue. I mean, the, the occasion for the report was realizing that even as unemployment numbers are coming down, African American unemployment is still higher than it was at the peak of the Great Recession for the general populace. So we have a real problem there. And what can the Fed possibly do about racially determined or racially influenced um, wage levels? One thing that we know from history is that um, African American unemployment is typically twice what white unemployment is or what the general unemployment number is. And so even if nothing changes about that proportion, reducing unemployment, holding the course on interest rates so that we can get to a fuller employment, reducing it by 1% reduces black unemployment by 2%. Mm. So obviously there are policy um, changes that need to go into effect. We need to be able to better implement social policy across the board. But the Fed actually plays a really important role and a role that can veto those social policies, mm -hmm. essentially, if they choose to raise interest rates. So can you see a new hashtag, Black Lives Matter, and so does the Fed? Totally right. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming in, Connie. It's great Thank to have you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks again. You can get more information about the Center for Popular Democracy and this report about black women's wages at our website. Well, you can now unsend email if you're a Gmail user. whoop de doop Forgive me if my enthusiasm is under control. For one thing, unsend's been a feature for ages. Google's announcement this June was merely that what had been experimental will now be built in. Once activated, Unsend will give Gmail users between 5 and 30 seconds to click Undo Send after firing off an email. And the news has been sold to us all as a huge relief for those who've ever been caught sending workplace rants directly to their boss or love notes to the wrong lover. For those who've ever lost a job over a misfired email, the new capability will come as cold comfort. There's no undo on their unemployment. For those like the Wall Street employees whose internal emails proved they knew exactly how nefarious the hoaxes and schemes they were part of were, it'll make no difference either. They've mostly gotten away with blowing up our economy without paying a price in any case. For the rest of us, the value of unsend may lie mostly in its placebo aspect, and that's dangerous. Google is still a $368 billion company that's gotten richer than most nations through extracting information well from its users without mostly their knowledge. As one former tech insider put it to me, a do not read feature would be more valuable than a do not send one. But that's not the worst of it. As many have reported by now, in the empire of big data, these companies have developed their own unique ways of sidestepping or destroying our privacy, labor, civil rights, and consumer laws. 
What really needs to be unsent is not our embarrassing email, it's the tech giant's rollback of the last century. In the data robber baron's world, an unsend button won't protect you. Your political action to defend yourself against their power just might. Tell me what you think. Write to Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at grittv.org. And thanks. Flanders show, we talk with Black Lives Matter co-founder Opal Tometi. So what we can do at the local level is challenge the very notion that we need more police. And the people of Chicago won a historic victory, reparations for police torture. I must admit, when I first heard the word reparations in association with the John Verge case, uh, I was apprehensive. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, is socialism still an American taboo? Not so much, says Professor Richard Wolff. I was hesitant, for example, to schedule a discussion of socialism, but so many people asked. The taboo has been broken. Nor was it ever, says Nation columnist John Nichols. America has uh, a very rich, uh, radical, socialist, social democratic history.